on behalf of the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law, the International Law Workshop, and the Global Trust uh, Research Project, I am delighted to welcome you to the inaugural event of the International Law Workshop at Tel Aviv Faculty of Law. I will first invite the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Ron Haris, to open the event. Please. Thanks, Ayal. I'm really delighted and excited to have the opportunity of hosting here the Bochum Faculty of Law of Tel Aviv University, the inaugural event of the International Law Workshop uh, sponsored by the Global Trust Research Project. I'm particularly honored that Professor James Crawford, one of the prominent academic scholars and jurists in the field of international law, joined us today. Uh, and shows respect to the workshop and shares with us his academic work, his practical experience, and his profound insights into the state of the field. No other visitor could be as fitting this special occasion. Uh, I'm also delighted to see such a, 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 a distinguished and varied uh, audience here. I know that we are competing now with the Prime Minister <laughs> that talks on the other side of the road, and with Maccabi Tel Aviv, who is celebrating its winning of the, champion, the European Championship not far from here. Uh, others would talk about the rise in importance of international law in contemporary, and acad in, in contemporary academic discourse and in law and politics. I just want to say a few words about its presence, present state and future role in our law school. There is a long history of faculty members researching and teaching international law going back to the days of Joram Dinstein and Nathan Lerner, who sits here and uh, uh, shows respect to our endeavors. Uh, in, re in recent years, the faculty in the field expanded. Eyal Benvenisti and Eyal Gross were joined recently by Doreen Lustig, who sits here, Itzhak Ben Baji, She's working in the field from an historical perspective. He's working in the field from its uh, philosophical, philosophical groundings. Many more faculty members dealing with diverse fields such as environmental law, immigration, antitrust, security regulation, cities and urbanization, complex litigation, taxation, intellectual property, and more now work on the intersections of their fields with international law. Eyal Benvenisti won last year the ERC, European Research Council, advanced grant for his Global Trust Project, which focuses on sovereigns as trustees for humanities. This grant allows exceptional, exceptionally established scholars, such as Eyal, leaders in the field, to pursue groundbreaking projects that open new uh, and exciting ways into uh, uh, the study of uh, international law. Uh, and this is exactly what Eyal and his colleagues in the faculty are doing these days. The grant allowed Eyal, our international faculty, and the law school as a whole to make leap for, a leap forward. We now have this international law for, uh, workshop. We have a growing number of PhD students in international law. Some of them sit here. We have a diverse and interesting group of international fellows from Asia, Europe, and the Americas. We have an international law concentration in our new international LLM program that was just inaugurated earlier this year. Eyal is directing that program and a few of the students in the program I saw here in the audience. Uh, 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 we will be uh, holding a major conference in a few weeks uh, uh, which is organized jointly by Theoretical Inquiries in Law, our leading uh, international journal, and Global Trust in the field. We will have some visitors, pro visiting professors in international law this year, next year, and hopefully uh, in future years from top universities around the globe. Our law school is on its way to become a major global hub for international law. Our exceptional faculty, Eyal's leadership, the ERC resources, the unique challenges of Israel and the Middle East as a whole in the field of international law, all contribute to the rise of international law to such a prominent position in the Bookman Faculty of Law and in Israeli academia in general. 
the next natural step will be the establishment of a center for international law and global governance at our law school. The great achievements of the past few years, the Global Trust Project, and the leadership, I hope, would allow us to move, to make this leap forward into establishing an international law a, a, a center, into establishing our workshop into the future. Uh, today's inaugural event, the audience and the visit and the visit and talk of Professor Crawford allows us to reflect upon the formation of this hub and to celebrate its first important achievements and the transition into a second, even more interesting and productive stage. I would like to thank the audience, the organizers, uh, our speaker. I look forward for a fascinating evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ron. It is an exceptional honor to welcome Professor James Crawford, the UL Professor of International Law at the University of Cambridge, and concurrently a research professor of law at in La Trobe, University of Australia. Professor Crawford kindly agreed to address our celebration for the inauguration of the International Law Workshop. We are grateful for that. We set up this workshop to provide an ongoing venue for deliberation about this strange creature called international law, a creature Professor Crawford aptly sees as reflecting a rage for order. In this workshop, we want to reflect on the origins of this rage and on its potential to secure order. How international law, together with domestic law and all kinds of new law, can, again using Professor Crawford's words, and I quote, meet the obvious and increasing need for cooperation between the 200 self-governing communities which are neighbors, each to each, in our one world. There are several people on our faculty, as Ron mentioned, who do international law in general or deal with specific subjects such as environmental law, labor, migration law, global justice, and the morality of international relations. The fact that so many of us here are drawn to this area reflects the growing importance of this need for cooperation between the 200 neighbors who share one big apartment building and must learn how to manage it justly and for the benefit of all. Given these goals, our obvious choice for inaugural address was Professor Crawford. The UL professorship is one of the oldest and no doubt the most prestigious chair in international law. Established in 1869, it was honored by luminaries who led, indeed defined, the emerging field of international law. Authorities such as Lassa Oppenheim, Arnold McNair, Hirsch Lauterpacht, Robert Jennings, Derek Bowett. Our understanding of today's international law is, to a large extent, shaped by these scholars' conception of this field as a system of laws that is capable of developing from within, like a fountain, and thereby can overcome the lack of central legislature and, the, and of compulsory dispute settlement functions. <laughs> Professor Crawford has no doubt met, if not more, the very high standards set by his eminent UL predecessors. In his writings, in his restating and progressively developing the law at the helm of the International Law Commission, the ILC, and in his pleadings at the International Court of Justice, he promoted and continues to promote an effective, just, and equitable international law, adapting it to the contemporary challenges of globalization. What characterizes Professor Crawford's work is a combination of meticulous legal argument, deep appreciation of all extra legal considerations, clarity of style, and above all, even-handedness. As a result, his say on any subject he addresses becomes the final say. As for his scholarship, I will give one example. Crawford's book on the creation of states in international law is the first, and for many, the last reference for anyone researching the crucial uh, question. Due to its impressive, and I quote a book review, its impressive depth of understanding of each situation and the ability to see the various aspects of each situation and to apply them to various legal arguments. As to progressively developing the law, Professor Crawford led the ILC's study and restatement of the crucial topic of state responsibility. For the non-experts among us, 
The law on state responsibility is the equivalent of what in domestic law is tort law and the law of, on remedies for contracts, breach of contracts, and many more. Professor Crawford steered the ILC to adopt a regime that was immediately received with universal praise, a regime that defines the law in this area. From his extensive practice in international dispute settlement, I wish briefly to point out three cases that advanced the protection of common natural resources and the environment. In 1989, while serving as the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Sydney, Crawford represented the small island of Nauru against his own country, Australia. And the successful litigation forced Australia to take responsibility for causing environmental damage during its trusteeship administration of Nauru. Don't worry, uh, Australia retained him to defend her in the next case before the ICJ. <laughs> Representing Hungary against Slovakia over the management of the Danube River, he managed to convince the ICJ to advance significantly the law protecting shared water resources by insisting on the need to jointly manage common resources. Most recently, representing Australia, again, against Japan, his arguments before the ICJ convinced the court to enhance the protection of whales and, in general, to limit the discretion of states that wish to unilaterally exploit common resources. These are but a few examples of James Crawford's many important contributions to international law. And may I say, to a better world for us all, the UL professorship was founded with the express injunction that the occupants of the chair should, and I quote, make it his aim in all parts of his treatment of the subject to lay down such rules and suggest such measures as might tend to diminish the evils of war and finally to extinguish war among nations. Professor Crawford certainly fulfilled this noble injunction by striving and in many cases with significant success to lay down rules and suggest measures that contribute to world welfare and peace. And this work has only begun. This is why it is a great honor for us to be able to invite Professor Crawford to give his talk. And after the talk, he agreed to take some questions. So with this, I welcome you. Thank you, Professor Ben Benisti. Thank you, Mr. Dean. It's a great pleasure to see in the audience Professor Lerner, whose work r r continues to be read, I am pleased to tell him. When uh, many of us, after some time after a publication, I won't say how long, uh, may find that our work tends to get neglected, yours is not, sir, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm not sure that it's the function of professors to, to diminish war amongst nations. And if it is, most professors are uniformly unsuccessful. <laughs> My own clients have often been at war. Generally speaking, they haven't gone to war afterwards, but I attribute that more to chance than to anything I've done. <laughs> it's easier to work in the environment because and I look at many of the cases I've done, as some, some have been mentioned by Professor Ben Venisti, have been environmental cases because the war over the environment tends to be a war of words, uh, often an endless war of words, to which court decisions um, uh, amount to uh, periods in a continuing debate rather than the final word. But we work in a subject in which there is no final word. One of the things that is difficult to appreciate about international law is that it's a continuing dialogue across time in which no one has the final word, not even a, a predecessor of mine as distinguished as Hirsch Lauterpacht, a very great name, had the final word on anything, even though his words are very often still quoted, because what we do is inherently impossible to be final. We, don't, we only know what is lawful through the process of testing. And as you, if I may say so to the, the younger ones amongst you, many of whom I've already had the pleasure of meeting, it's your function to go on testing and to go on seeking the truth without any illusion that when you find the truth, it will be there forever. Having said that, I need to talk about globalization. And what can one say about globalization except everything? 
Much has been written about globalization and international law, and it's no easy task to find a discernible focus or a cogent thread in the literature. As a sociological phenomenon and an idea, globalization is multifaceted. It comprises so many elements that it risks becoming all things to all people. In this respect, it's not different from other similarly contested meta-concepts such as constitutionalism, legal pluralism, or even the international rule of law. At the same time, there's an additional difficulty presented by the concept of globalization because it's not tied to any specific normative agenda, except perhaps the free market and economic integration themselves, of course, are highly contested. So globalization and international law are in an ambivalent relationship. International law has a normative agenda. Globalization, it's not clear that it does. But it's quite clear that globalization makes international law more relevant. As the global replaces the local or national as a frame of reference for human activity, and as human communities come often despite themselves more integrated through economic, pol political and social processes that seem inevitable and that transcend national boundaries, the horizons of the international legal system are enlarged. But it's Professor Benvenisti's insight that they're not enlarged enough. And the challenge for international law is to cope with that situation in a way which remains true to its origins and to its mission and achievable in real life without going overboard and making, for example, all of us into international legal persons. It's commonly said, and Hirsch Lauterpark said it, that the international, ultimate international legal person is the individual. But if everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody, if I can quote the song. And there are differences between people in the world, there are differences between entities in the world, there are differences between states in the world. It's international laws one of its functions to try to make sense of that situation without going overboard. Globalization threatens to shake some of the basic foundations of international law, puts pressures on international law which, if not addressed, will threaten to make it much less relevant. But, of course, those challenges are challenges very much to the state itself, and our conception of the state is changing under the pressures that, in, that globalization puts on it. The classical interstate system accommodated the complexity of transactions occurring at the world's, on the world stage by one of two devices, either incorporating them, as for example in the, in the mechanism of diplomatic protection, or ignoring them. You can't incorporate all of those things into the state without a form of etatisation, I use a French term uh, with bad accent, uh, and it's not an English term, thank heavens, which we, we won't actually tolerate, which is actually at a certain level uh, involves um, a totalitarian conception of the state. And the one thing that globalization is inconsistent with is a totalitarian conception of the state. But at the same time, we need the state to do many of the things that we're trying to do. So that is the ultimate tension. We can't ignore the developments, we can't incorporate them. We have to find a middle way. As Sergei Sur noted, globalization asks of the state that it serve, and I quote, not so much as the filter between the internal and the external, but rather that it facilitate passage back and forth, act as an interface, not an enclosure. And the question is, those are very grand words. They're even grander when they're expressed in French. But the question is, what do they mean? The notion that the sovereign state is waning was popular amongst legal scholars in the 1990s. We heard the stories of the decline of the state, the disappearance of the state, even bringing the state back in as if it had gone somewhere else. We no longer hear such phrases as often or in such a strong terms. It's clear, and not only with the benefit of hindsight, that the state is not going away, nor is sovereignty as the underpinning structural principle of the international system. Globalization challenges the state, it challenges sovereignty, but it doesn't offer real alternatives to them. And that's really the first thing to realize about it. But no one's come up with a recipe, of various people, including some very distinguished philosophers, have tried. Uh, as to what would do if we did send the state away to some anonymous location. Uh, 
Indeed, it's remarkable how political philosophers over the ages have done international law as badly as they have. Uh, and I speak about Kant as well as Hegel as well as Rawls. When they get to international law, somehow they can't forget their nationality. Uh, and the veil of ignorance does not apparently extend to nationality. If you know that someone is a national of a particular state, you already know quite a lot about them and about their environment. And the veil of nationality has no, the veil of ignorance has no place. But sovereignty does have its values as well as its problems. It plays a significant role in promoting the degree of formal equality, which in a fundamentally unequal world enhances the, sta the standing of small states and their prospects of many, meaningful participation. I realised that very early in my career when I contrasted the case of the Ocean Islanders or the Banabans in their domestic legal proceedings, Tito and Waddell, in the United Kingdom, with the position of the Nauruans in their international legal proceedings. Here was I, an Australian, representing a, a state of 10,000 people before my own state, which at that time had about 15 million and yet we were forensically equal. And that led to a situation in which the court was able to judge, at least at the preliminary objection stage, that the Nauruans had a case, despite the rather emphatic and, I might say, contemptuous dismissal of that case by successive Australian governments. The case eventually succeeded in a settlement to the tune of $103 million, including, I'm pleased to say, costs. <laughs> the first and last time I've recovered costs in the international court. <laughs> And more recently, in a case between Mauritius and the United Kingdom, which finished uh, a week ago, uh, we saw the same thing, a very small uh, third world state, although d considerably developed in itself, against a very large former coloniser, which was rather contemptuous in its dismissal of continuing claims in relation to the Chagos Archipelago. Who knows what decision will be given? But these cases called upon the respondent to be accountable for its conduct. And therefore, they therefore played a role which is consistent with the idea of formal equality, a view which is often held in contempt in the, political, in the international relations literature, but which still has a real value. Moreover, globalisation notwithstanding, states retain their collective monopoly of international process. It's therefore more productive to think of sovereignty as a flexible but enduring concept that's adapting to globalisation consistent with a variety of often complex internal forms of government and with the evolution of international institutions. And no one, not even Brussels, has come up with an international institution which is immune from the problems of sclerosis, bureaucratisation and so on. Name me a state that has internally reformed itself. One can name very many. Name me a state that is capable of imprisoning its former leaders. One can name several. <laughs> Name me an international organisation that has refor re reformed itself from within. The Vatican, a very funny international organisation. Perhaps one or two others. It's difficult to find them. So the state, with its capacity for reforming itself, retains considerable value. So far, I think Professor Benvenisti and I are in agreement. In his leading American Journal article, which lays down the conceptual framework for the Global Trust Project, he invites us to think of sovereign states as trustees of humanity. The term is challenging, but it's also difficult. If, if everybody's somebody, then no one's anybody, and if we're trustees for everyone, there are considerable difficulties of representation, to put it at its lowest. A trustee, by definition, is, is responsible to defined persons, or at least to a defined class. Now, I don't deny that humanity is a defined class, but quite a class. We haven't yet succeeded in working out a system of representation for humanity as a whole, nor have John Rawls, Immanuel Kant, or, or G.W.F. Hegel, to take only some examples. Of course, states should not be seen as proprietors, either of their resources or of their people. And to that extent, we are treating the state as a public law entity and no longer as a private law entity. Bartlepark made relatively few mistakes. His instinct was remarkably good, but one of the mistakes he made was to analogise international law to private law. International law is precisely not private law. States are pre precisely not proprietors in relation to their land or in relation to their people. They don't own their people. 
the people own the state, although the systems of representation are often archaic and quite frequently insecure. To treat state property as pro to treat state territory as property, which the private law analogy invites, is intensely problematic. For example, when Colombia claimed the San Andreas Archipelago in the Nicaragua Colombia case, that was a positively immoral claim. The people of the San Andreas Archipelago, which, which went back six, seven generations, had no affiliation with Nicaragua, no desire to be part of Nicaragua, and they could be claimed as if they were a piece of property. Of course, the court dismissed their claim on orthodox grounds because there was no basis for the claim as a claim to property. But the claim should never have been made. It was made for purely tactical purposes. It should have been dismissed in limine. We need to work on our own rules, in particular in the context of acquisition of territory, to make states more like trustees than they perhaps have been, trustees for themselves, and not trustees for people who are not part of themselves. In that spirit, Professor Benvenisti concludes that sovereigns should have, and it's only a step for international lawyers to go from the should have to the have, should have obligations vis-a-vis -vis foreign stakeholders. Though he doesn't, he accepts that in the present state of international organisation, those responsibilities can only be responsibilities in the nature of a droit de regard, of a, of a taking into account, not of a veto or an affirmative uh, uh, right to vote or a right to participate in public affairs of the individual state. Um, if there were such an accountability, it would, be presumably, it would presumably be reflected in the decisions of investment tribunals dealing with foreign investors where you would think there is a droit de regard. And to some extent there is, if you trace carefully the decisions on legitimate expectation, on equality of treatment, uh, and so on. But nonetheless there are important differences. In particular, investment law has to be made consistent with the positive virtues of sovereignty, including the right to tax and, reading today's paper, the right to change one's taxation regime in the absence of legitimate expectations based on express promises. So that globalization is a generalization, but legitimate expectation depends on the particulars. And the, more, the broader lesson for that is that we can talk about general concepts, but we still have to mould them to the realities of individual systems and of individual states, of individual sovereign communities. The state is no leader, the state is no government, the state is the people. The government is the government of the people, not the government of the state in a proprietorial sense. I turn from those general reflections to look at a particular problem, which is a problem which I now see has been uh, something of a light motive in my life. Unlike Richard Wagner, I only appreciate the light motives afterwards. Um, and that is the problem of representation of the public interest. International law used to be uh, of the international public interest, which is highly relevant to the Global Trust Project. International law used to be understood as a mainly, mainly bilateral affair, even when multilateral treaties became prominent, they're largely conceptualized as bundles of bilateral relations tied together in the same language or in similar language, depending on reservations and so on. The existence of multilateral treaties was not the same thing as the existence of multilateral obligations. And this reluctance to accept that international law could form a system was famously or infamously encapsulated by the International Court's decision in the South West Africa cases in, 19, 19, in 1966, a decision reached on the casting vote of the only Australian ever to be a judge of the International Court, President Spender, for whose vote I hereby retrospectively apologise. <laughs> I won't go into the details of that case, but the Court treated the multilateral relationship created by the Trust for South West Africa, now Namibia, as if it was a bilateral relationship between a defunct international organisation and South Africa, thereby in effect destroying accountability. I don't think the Court would do the same thing today. Uh, and uh, what I want to do and what remains of this lecture is to trace the, the process by which first the, the Court itself in Barcelona Traction, then the International Law Commission 
in the ILC articles on responsibility and latterly the court itself in a series of cases have taken steps towards the multilateralization of responsibility. The process started with the idea of preemptory norms in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And it was taken further by the court in the Barcelona Traction and again in Namibia. But only, as it were, in passing. By the time the ILC concluded its project on state responsibility in 2001, after a somewhat abbreviated second reading, the concepts of preemptory norms and obligations ergo omnes obligations to the international community as a whole. We managed to get rid of the Latin, I'm pleased to say. For a long time, people had thought that the Latin conveyed meaning. If I say to you, obligations ergo omnes, you nod sagely and say, this, this person has told me something. <laughs> Similarly, if I say, jus kogens, you say, yes, of course, yeah. and jump to attention. Peremptory norms and obligations to the international community as a whole. Um, Replace, replacing the old concept and uh, completely inappropriate conception of international crimes. One thing worse than analogising international law to private law was to analogise it to criminal law in the absence of anything like due process. So the Commission in its second reading developed a distinction between injured states and if we, didn't, we couldn't find a, an acceptable phrase for it, other states. I proposed interested states, but that didn't work. Injured states were states in a, in a standard bilateral relationship or states specially affected by a breach, in the way of the English law of public nuisance. Other states were states which didn't have individual rights in relation to performance, in the sense that if you have a right, you can veto the conduct in question, but had a legally protected interest in ensuring that the conduct occurred. We reflected that in Article 48 of the ILC Articles on Responsibility. Apart from certain PhD students, if I've contributed anything to international law, it is Article 48. And I beg, you, beg those of the next generation to preserve it, <laughs> in the way that we preserve Professor Lerner's words these days. Article 48 has two sides to it. First of all, it says that in a situation in which states are parties to a regime, a treaty regime in the public interest, all states can invoke a breach of that legal regime, even if they don't have any specifically cognizable legal interest in performance, in the sense that you would have if you were an injured state, covered by Article 42, or if you were specially affected. And then it says that all states, without exception, are parties to an obligation to the international community as a whole, because they're part of the international community. On some views, they make it up. It's the combination of those two provisions that encapsulates the, no the notion of standing to invoke responsibility without being specifically injured. When I, when I was involved in bringing the first of my two fisheries cases against Japan, the Southern Bluefin Tuna case for Australia in the late 90s, it took me quite a long time to realise, and it took some of the Australian side even longer, that Australia didn't own the tuna tuna were in the public domain. It's true that the tuna passed through the Australian econ exclusive economic zone on their way to the Southern Ocean to be fished by Japan. But as far as I know, passing through the Australian economic, uh, exclusive economic zone is not a, a equivalent to baptism, <laughs> still less to naturalisation. As we see recently, when anyone gets the Australian exclusive economic zone, the idea that they thereby become naturalised is not regarded very, very... Indeed, you can get to the territorial sea or to the territory itself and you can be sent somewhere else, to Nauru, for example. Um, so the, the fish themselves were free. They didn't belong to anyone. Australia's interest in the tuna was the interest that all states' parties to the Southern Bluefin Tuna Convention had. There were at that time only three in a public resource. It was an interest in management and not an injury. The fact that Australia would have liked to catch them on the way through and they escaped being caught was, was simply the, the chance of a fishery and not a legal right. We realised that more clearly in the second case. Uh, I should say we, we lost the Southern Bluefin Tuna case on points in a t technical knockout. My worst professional defeat. 
So it was with some trepidation that I approached the second fisheries case against Japan. Well, it's not a fisheries case. Far be it from me to compare whales to fish. They're marine mammals. But you fish them or you whale them, I suppose you might say. Australia brought proceedings in relation to the Japanese uh, capture of uh, whales in the Southern Ocean, some of which, although not all of which, were caught within a claimed exclusive economic zone of Australia off the Australian Antarctic Territory, a zone which Japan, in common with most other states in the world, does not recognise. Um, but that wasn't the ground on which the claim was brought. The claim was brought because Japan was conducting, quote, scientific fishing under Article 8 of the Whaling Convention of 1946 in circumstances which were not justified from a scientific point of view. Now, what is most interesting, I, I've lectured once on the whaling case this afternoon and some of you were there, and I won't repeat what I said in detail. But one of the things that was most significant about the case was that Japan did not complain uh, that Australia had no interest in the scientific whaling program in the Southern Ocean. There was no complaint about lack of standing in the way that South Africa complained about the lack of standing of Ethiopia and Liberia in the, second uh, in the first and second Southwest Africa cases. Japan simply accepted that Australia had the right to bring proceedings and to challenge the this Japanese decision-making process without making arguments which I hope would have been unsuccessful on the Article 30, 48 ground, on the absence of Article 48 as a matter of customary international law. The court had already given some indications of what it thought in the case brought by Belgium against Senegal, which shows the present slightly equivocal state of the basic principle of standing in the public interest. Because Belgium argued on the one hand that it had individual rights to the extradition of Habre on the ground that it had engaged its legal process which had been frustrated by inaction on the part of Senegal. And then it argued that it was a party to the torture convention, which is the basis for the most important charges brought against Habre. And therefore it had a right in compliance with the extradition provisions of the torture convention in common with all other states' parties to the convention. Now, as in the whaling case, so in the Belgium-Senegal case, no other state had asserted that right, but the court nonetheless held that it existed. It declined to say that Belgium was an injured state in the meaning of Article 42, but it did hold without quoting Article 48, without quoting the number 48, that it, Belgium had an interest as a party to the regime. And I'm sure it was on the basis of Belgium and Senegal that Japan did not take the same objection in the whaling case. Uh, and I'm confident that it would have been rejected on the same ground. I should say a word about the decision in the whaling case on the merits. Um, now I can get to the real bit of my text. There's a second lesson to be drawn from whaling in the Antarctic. I refer to the approach that the International Court took in addressing global concerns in the context of the dispute about scientific whaling. There are two points to be made. First, while Australia's standing was implicitly affirmed, the Court didn't raise the point for itself, and Japan hadn't raised it. The Court refrained from adopting an explicitly evolutionary interpretation of the Whaling Convention. We expected at the time either that the court would emphasize the margin of appreciation and the decide for Japan, or that it would emphasize the evolutionary character of the whaling convention and decide for Australia. And the former argument might have been expected from the, certainly from the court that decided the second Southwest Africa case. The latter argument might have been expected from someone who didn't know the court very well. Um, but there were real problems with an evolutionary interpretation of the Whaling Convention. The Whaling Convention was adopted in 1946, and its principal aim was to preserve whales, not so that people could go and look at them, which is the principal Australian interest in whales, is to conduct whale-watching tours, on which I'm reliably informed you rarely see whales. <laughs> um, instead, the 
principal aim of the 1946 convention was to catch whales, to make sure there were more whales to be caught. It was not a standard conservation convention. It was not like CITES. Moreover, there were no concerns except in relation to fin whales in the three species that, Japanese were, the, the, that the Japanese whaling program was targeting. Minke whales, there are plenty of minke whales. They're contemptuously referred to as the rats of the sea. They're rather smaller than blue whales. Humpbacks are re recovering at a rapid rate. Fin whales more, do more doubtful, but the Japanese never managed to catch more than about two a year. So the species were not endangered. The interest at stake was the interest of the international community in an exception to a conservation convention, even if it wasn't a very good conservation convention. The court did neither of the above. It neither adopted an, em an emphasis on the subjective application of Article 8, nor did it adopt an, interp an evolutionary interpretation of the convention. Instead, it asked the fundamental question, was this program proportionate to the aims which Japan had laid down in establishing the program? So they applied a standard administrative law methodology. And they came to the conclusion, and I won't go into the details, that the Japanese program was not proportionate to the aims it had in mind. Japan had not considered catch, catch, catching fewer whales, had not considered the results of JAPA 1 in adopting the second program, JAPA 2, had not considered the scientific advice which their own experts said they had received, that taking 10 fin whales a year and 50 humpbacks a year was scientifically useless, had not taken that into account. They had not considered alternatives and they would produced almost no peer-reviewed papers. In the circumstances of the court, though persuaded that the program was ostensibly scientific, was not persuaded that it was adapted to the, in its implementation, was adapted to the purposes that were laid down. That is standard administrative law reasoning. And the important points to emphasize here are two. First of all, to adopt standard administrative law reasoning in relation to the decisions of a state, and to adopt it in a way that you disqualify the decision, was a first. All the previous environmental cases either involved clear bilateral damage or were relatively unsuccessful. We can talk about Gabchikovo in question time. Gabchikovo was, a, I would say, a score draw in soccer terms uh, because aspects of the Hungarian case were accepted and aspects were not. But as a, a, a clear victory, it was the first victory for, the, for what Professor Ben Benisti would call a global trust or a global interest in terms of representation made by the court through administrative law methodology to applying the principle of proportionality to a decision made, by, made deliberately and maintained deliberately by a state. And it's therefore of very considerable significance. And its significance is in, in effect hiding its own significance. Because it doesn't, the court is very careful not to go into methodology. It articulates the standard of review. The dissentients complained that it didn't say where the standard of review came from. It came from normal administrative law principles of proportionality. And the court simply applied that to a situation in which a state was exercising a right to catch marine mammals on the high seas, which the convention apparently gave, and which Japan would have had if it had bothered to leave the convention, which it didn't want to do. So there's a very delicate balance there between normal judicial process and the application of normal judicial process to a new situation. And it was done without bringing in either contentious notions of um, progressive interpretation or difficult to prove concepts such as abuse of rights or bad faith. Moreover, the court ordered Japan to stop the program. It went further immediately than it might have done. That's a very strong finding, and Japan has stopped the program, at least in the Southern Ocean. We didn't challenge the program in the, in the Northern Hemisphere while it works out how to conduct whaling in the Southern Ocean in a, in a manner consistent with Article 8. We will see what's this space. Nothing is ever final. So the recent case law of the court suggests new possibilities for the enforcement of multilateral obligations through litigation in the collective interest. 
Now, it's true that there is a strand in the court's jurisprudence which points the other way. I refer to East Timor, arrest warrant, Congo, Rwanda, Georgia, Russia, Germany, Italy, in which the court affirmed the existence of multilateral obligations but declined to enforce them on procedural or formal grounds dealing with jurisdiction or admissibility. And what it says is that jurisdiction and admissibility are bilateral even if the underlying obligations are multilateral. That represents the present law and we have to live with it. But there is more jurisdiction than one thinks and there is more emphasis on court procedure than there used to be. So over time with the Law of the Sea Convention and others, I think we may see more cases of this sort. In conclusion, globalization creates new demands for an international legal system whose basic unit remains the state, which is structured on the basis of the principle of sovereign equality and a presumption of exclusive representation by the state of its people. It's in inverted commas. Globalization creates anxieties that international law and international lawyers will not be up to the new task and that international law will become less relevant. But at the same time, it's important to appreciate how international law has evolved and adapted to new realities by reinventing and redefining some of the attributes of its original foundations. Epoir se move. Nonetheless, it moves. We've revisited the evolution of the notion of multilateral obligations in the light of recent developments. This is one of the ways in which international law becomes more globalised, whatever that may mean. I'm sure the Global Trust will make a valuable contribution to this process by pointing to new ways to reimagine the state, sovereignty and the point and purposes of international law. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much, Professor Crawford. Um, questions? Please. My name is Odette Bakhtain. I am a criminal lawyer in Israel, and I am also admitted to plead at the International Criminal Court. My question is okay. to you, and I am very happy to see you today, of course. It's not every day that we can uh, listen to the professors yet read what they think in the book. <laughs> My question now is, do you think that legal war, wars will replace armed conflict in the 21st century? 21st. 21st century. And how the prosecution of highly ranking leaders will affect the order between states. I'm glad that we started with an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a specialist in the laws of war or in the use ad bellum. I was involved in the International Law Commission in the creation of the International Criminal Court the creation of about as many problems as it has solved. <laughs> but nonetheless, having had some vision of the, inter of the International Criminal Court from within and, and more of the ICTY, I still think it was the right thing to do at the time. Not because it's going to prosecute many people, but probably because it's not going to prosecute many people. The real difficulty it's had has been its focus on Africa, and that's a matter we could discuss uh, at considerable length. What I would say is that there's empirical evidence that sensible military personnel in developed countries are now much more aware of the demands of accountability of international law than they were earlier. They don't question the existence of international law, they're more likely to question the existence of orders which may seem to violate international law. It was significant that prior to the invasion of Iraq, about which we could have a long debate, the British Commander-in-Chief asked for orders in writing, and he asked for an opinion from the Attorney General that this was lawful. That didn't happen before the First World War. Now, the process of controlling armed conflict when there is such bitter enmity between peoples in certain contexts is a very difficult and long-term process, but at least it's begun. 
not of any obligation to grant their, them a voice in decision making. And then you were also saying um, states are not some um, entity for themselves, they're the people. But when we speak about people, then certainly it's a very fluid, um, difficult to delimit concept. And we will we'll have people, but we cannot um, draw borders where, without um, excluding some persons who will not have a say in being excluded. So, given this um, situation of states as always being dependent on historical contingencies, on people being his, uh, historically formed, um, how can we hold up this uh, statement that no foreigners will ever have a voice, say, for example, in the decision on um, citizenship law? Well, International lawyers used to say that the extension of nationality was a pure question of domestic jurisdiction. And that was the, all the teaching in the traditional books. No international lawyer would say that now. The courts have looked at cases of extension of nationality or refusal to extend nationality. They've looked at cases of refusal to grant uh, an entrance to, to foreigners on grounds such as non-discrimination. And they've exercised administrative law functions with respect to decisions of that sort. Uh, for example, in relation to the, the, the Roma rights case in the House of Lords. This is not a, a function limited to international courts. But you see in decisions like Sufraki uh, that international courts have their own role in relation to nationality. You see that in decisions of the European Court of Justice or the Court of Justice of the European Communities in relation to European nationality. So the law is evolving. And just because one doesn't say that there is a general right on the part of non-nationals to participate in the local political process, I think that remains, remains true. You cannot say that there is no right in any circumstance for individuals uh, to be continually excluded. So international law is in an intermediate situation here. Sometimes the courts, I think, go too far. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights recently decided that the interception of a boatload of potential refugees on the high seas was collective expulsion from the state in a case called Hirsi Jamar in Italy. I think that was great. I thought it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's collective expulsion, that's a non-derogable obligation under Article 4 of Protocol 4. Whereas the obligation of non reforma which is as near as possible in this field to being a peremptory norm, has exceptions. The law, the law mustn't be incoherent, as far as we can make it coherent. It's not coherent to say you have a non-derogable obligation on Article 4 and the Protocol 4 not to engage in collective ex ex expulsions. The real collective expulsions we're familiar with, and the people here, I'm sure that one of your relatives, was, one of your ancestors was collectively expelled. That's a, that's a really, really important obligation. Let's not trivialise it or minimise it by talking about boatloads of Libyan refugees on the high seas. I'm not suggesting that the Italian conduct was lawful. It wasn't lawful. But Article 3 copes with that. You don't need to inflate concepts. And we do have a role as lawyers in ensuring the consistency of the law across the various fields. Thank you very much, Professor Crawford, for your presentation and for honoring us with your presence. Um, I have a question about the implications of globalization in a somewhat different realm, and, um, but related to what you said about Luz Cogas and Helga Omez to some extent. Um, I'm wondering um, if you see the impact of globalization also on the hierarchy of norms within the international legal order and the international legal system, and perhaps also 
um, so, so, so not only on the hierarchy of norms and what a norm might be under international law today, as opposed to maybe what it was in 1945, but also uh, look, looking back at the state now, um, whether perhaps the state, the, the lawmaking prerogative that the state had um, within the international legal system and its ability to influence the international legal order perhaps has also eroded and changed uh, because of globalization as there are more actors involved in lawmaking which are non-state actors, organizations, uh, private groups, uh, public-private partnerships, and so on. So the globalization aspect of, of lawmaking, the impact on lawmaking. What I'm going to say it may be somewhat controversial, but God preserve me in the Parliament of Non-Governmental Organizations. I quite like a Parliament representing a people, established by, in a, by national law in accordance with international norms. Um, people talk about this, the role of the state in lawmaking, but the state, as an individual entity, has a rather limited role in lawmaking. The United States can't get rid of treaties that it doesn't like, although it's tried to do so on various occasions, and it can exercise power to get rid of them. The United Kingdom can't get rid of treaties that it doesn't like. The reason that Concord flew was because there was a treaty. If it had been a commercial deal, it would never have flown because it was ridiculously uneconomic. The reason that the, the Gatchakova power plant is still there is because of a treaty. Individual states don't have lawmaking power. States collectively have lawmaking power. And they have lawmaking power in relation to peremptory norms. That imposes considerable constraints when you want to change peremptory norms. And that's a, a difficult process. We don't have much experience of it. But it seems to me that given the alternatives, since we don't have a world parliament, and since, since uh, I don't want a world parliament made up of NGOs, it's about as good as we can get. We need to work on the state to make it more representative, and I hope that AR's work will contribute to that through the idea of trusteeship. But in the end, there aren't any other entities that are representative of peoples. International law is a system of representation, and its principal system of representation is the state. Uh, and it's those states collectively that make international law, by and large. It doesn't mean that NGOs are without influence. No one who looked at the International Criminal Court statute could think that. Um, thank you for the valuable speech. I'd like to go back a little bit for the Wake case and maybe compare it from there, um, a larger phenomenon and wonder about it. Um, actually, you kind of explained this in the Wake case that the convention in the first place was created to to uh, to make it possible for for word killing and for preserving words to see them. Um, I was wondering. If the court, by using the proportionality and reasonability, this course is actually creating a legal standard, in this case for real killing, but maybe in other cases for uh, human rights violations, uh, in, uh, in other cases maybe for uh, a civilian, attack on civilian use, of course, I, different uh, contexts. In this case, what I thought is like by, by uh, by uh, prohibiting Japan from uh, continuing JARPA 2, it maybe is creating an incentive for it to create JARPA 3 that is uh, in proportionality with the scientific uh, uh, objectives, and by, by that, kill the same amount of, of uh, waves <laughs> and make it harder to, to prove that it's disproportionate. Uh, with the, but because it's, related, it, it's in relation to the objective it sets in the first place for itself. Well, the law is never finished, and we'll see what Japan does with JARPA 3. I can assure you that they won't be trying to catch 935 Mickey whales and 10 fin whales. We'll see what they want to do and what they're capable of doing with their, the amount that they're prepared to spend on Southern Ocean whaling. Um, but the, the killing of whales is not contrary to a peremptory norm. Uh, maybe some would say unfortunately, but it ain't. But the killing of whales is consistent with international law in certain circumstances. Uh, and proportionality is how the court adjudges a particular program. In the human rights field, there are certain peremptory norms. Torture is never justified by considerations of proportionality. Uh, the killing of innocent civilians is never justified by considerations of proportionality if they're targeted. 
although of course the targeting rules themselves contain elements of proportionality. No one has got any experience of the concrete application of human rights and humanitarian law can see that considerations of proportionality don't arise. They arise all the time. And we're developing a public law of con constraints on the state, which is the greatest contribution of my professional lifetime of international law. Olga, last question. Thank you for your talk, it was very interesting, and I was wondering uh, what do you think are the reasons that cause co the courts to adapt those approaches to the role of states as representative or of global interest, and do you think it's maybe the influence of scholars or influence of certain events or maybe the need of legitimacy? Well, of course, why courts do things is a difficult study. It's true of national courts as well as of international courts. They do them because they want to be relevant. Uh, and it's natural for individuals who have studied something for the whole of their life to want to be relevant. But, um, I mean, in a way, whaling wasn't a difficult case. When Japan's own scientific expert says that the program is not justified, it was very difficult to justify the program. And you would need to have a, a closer case before we could really assess the main influences on the court. Uh, it was a 12-4 decision. I think if JAPA had been, JAPA 2 had been justifiable with a following wind, it might have been a lot closer. But the case, the, the, for various reasons, the Japanese case fell apart in the old hearing. Uh, and it was an impressive indication of the court's seriousness in listening to argument and listening to evidence and taking into account that they did what they did. We can't be assumed to be replicable in other situations. There are obviously important limits on what courts, and especially international courts, can do. Give them a mandate and they can do quite a lot. Well, I want uh, to thank you, Professor Crawford, for uh, honoring us with your visit and with this insightful uh, talk, and we'll continue to contemplate on these questions. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming, and you're welcome to our international law workshops this year, next fall, and annually.